he had a choice on how he was going to respond to the rest of his life. And it's the same with you. And don't let Satan win. Honestly, what you need to do is say, let's start a compassion ministry. And what we're going to do, he has a billion stars he's, he's, he's in control of. He can deal with your and that God's saying, I don't want that. I want you to, to, to treat me like you would treat your best friend. Those are real feelings that we think we got to keep to ourselves like, shh, I don't know, God, where we can't know. He knows. We are in session three of our Seal of God with our special guest, um, Chad Williams, who was a former Navy SEAL. If you want to know his whole story, go back to session one. And what we're doing is a question and answer. So everyone that's been in the audience has asked questions. So we're going to do this hour with just lots of question and answers for him. So um, if you want to know more about our ministry, you can go online to womensbiblestudy.com. And that's how you can know all about us. Chad's books will also hopefully be available on our website. Or we'll have a link on there for his book, Seal of God. So we'll go from that. OK, yay, we're back. Oh, I feel so much better after I ate. I was so hungry. In coma. <laughs> it was kind of sad. Okay, lots and lots of questions, so we're going to hurry through this. There was actually extra questions up here, so I'm just going to go for it. And for if it. you, oh, okay. Uh, what percentage of seals that you worked with are fellow believers? That's a good question. Um, I would say that it's a, a very a scarce number uh, of, of believers. Uh, there's a difference, I guess you could say, between those that claim to be believers, and I'm sure most people probably experience this. I mean, they say that we live in, you know, America, almost everybody's a Christian. Well, what is American Christianity uh, exactly? Um, so it, it was pretty hard to come by uh, some true believers, you know, in the SEAL teams. It's, a, it's kind of a rough group of guys, you know. The, these are guys that like to get things done in their own power, their own might, and, uh, and so... You know, they like to live that sort of rock star uh, lifestyle as a Navy SEAL, you know. And so uh, I really only knew a few guys uh, that were actually really believers, guys that I could really lean on. And they didn't really happen to be, you know, in my same platoon except for, except for one of them. Okay. Yeah, so it's just that they're, they're guys that definitely need the Lord. From your book, it sounds kind of like a tough crowd. Can you hear him okay? Yeah, okay. It seems like they're kind of a tough crowd. Yeah, they're definitely a rough, rough group of guys. So know, if you have a else. group of, of you that makes it, uh, were you friends? Like, did you, could you consider them like, hey, they're my lifelong friends? Or, or was it a whole different ballgame when you're... It's definitely a brotherhood, and any one of us would die, you know, for right. the other. Um, it's, it's very much like a family. It's like a dysfunctional family, you know. We can really turn on each other and say some of the meanest things to each other right. sometimes. But you know that your brother's going to cover your back when it, when it really When you need to, like if someone's going to shoot at you. That's a good idea. Um, let's see, are you, um, did, when you became a Christian, I think this is what, this, um, did being a believer help you deal with being a SEAL better? Uh, well, you know, before I was just kind of an angry person, right? I wanted to get right. revenge. And then I, I become a believer and I realize that, you know, life is valuable. You know, that we have a value that's been given to us by God. We're made in his image. And so I had to kind of circle back around and think about, all right, is there a just cause for what we do as Navy SEALs? And it didn't take me long to, you know, see very clearly uh, and just intuitively I knew that it's right what we're doing, because ultimately, what are we doing? Well, we're going after evil men that have intentions of bringing harm upon others, and if they're not stopped, they will be successful. Okay. You know, it's been said that all that's required for evil to triumph is for good men to stand back and do nothing. And so how does this uh, comport with, well, Christianity? You know, a lot of people bring up things like the Ten Commandments and say, well, doesn't it say, thou shall not kill? You know, right. or what about Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount? Didn't he say, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to them also, mm -hmm. uh, well, you know, let's go back to the Ten Commandments. Does it say, thou shall not kill? No, it doesn't say that. In the Hebrew, it says, thou shall not murder. That is the word okay. that's being used there. And we do need to distinguish between uh, murder and, and killing. Murdering is taking, you know, maliciously innocent life. It's like going up and down your neighborhood and just taking people out, you mm -hmm. know, with a bat. Uh, you know, in Ecclesiastes, it says, hey, there is a, a time. There's a time to kill. You know, if there's a man that is uh, set, he has intentions of bringing harm upon others, strapping suicide vests, you know, on a mentally handicapped women like has been done, and they will not stop unless you literally stop them, right. uh, then you don't, 
you don't choose to, you know, just go take them out for the heck of it. You always try and preserve life wherever possible. But if that's what's required of you, you will go with that. But you always try and go with the lesser. You try and preserve life wherever possible. Like the last operation I brought up where we got into this gunfight, uh, you know, th this guy had a lot of, uh, you know, dudes set up in positions to shoot at us. We get in this gunfight where, you know, some of those guys die. We end up getting the guy that we're going after wounded. And what do we do? Do we go finish him off? No. We want to preserve life wherever possible. So I was actually one of the guys that, that grabbed him and, and carried him into one of our own hospitals to save him. Um, but then going back to the Jesus, you know, uh, where he says, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. I don't think that Jesus is speaking in a wooden, literal sense right there, like you're just to be a doormat to be walked on. And I think it's pretty clear when you look at the context of it all. So they say the key to any text is really the context. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just prior to that, Jesus says, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and right. cast it from you. For it's more profitable for you that one of your members should perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And he says the same thing about the eye. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. And so we get it that this is a figure of speech that he's using here. He's just basically pointing out that, hey, sin is very serious. It has devastating consequences. Does he really want you cutting off your hand and plucking out your eye? No. This is just a figure of speech he's using. And uh, I think that when he says, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. The figure of speech he's trying to get across here, the lesson is, don't go returning evil for evil. In other words, if somebody has committed an act of evil against you, but then the dust settles, all, all said and done, don't go seeking that person out to try and get revenge. But if something's happening in the moment, certainly he believes in uh, self-defense and defending others. Uh, you know, in fact, when he sent his disciples out for a second time, uh, he says, look, I sent you guys out without money, without a knapsack, you know, without a sword. But this time I tell you, you know, like, look, bring your sandals. What are the sandals for? For walking on. You know, bring your knapsack with that. What's that for? To put things in. And he says, bring a sword. And what would the sword be for? It would be for self-defense. And so I think that as a Christian, it's, it's pretty easy to see uh, that uh, defending freedom, you know, and, and preserving life is, is something that is totally consistent, you know, within right. Christianity. Well, the, we're, we're um, in Joshua right now. We're doing a series called Life is a Battle. And, I mean, God sanction war, go in and take over the evil people. So that would kind of totally make, that was one of the questions, a lot of the questions were, what do you think about war and can we do that? Yeah, one of the ironies is, is a lot of these people that have some type of issue with that, you know, you ask them, well, what's your view on uh, abortion? And they go, oh, I believe it's, uh, you know, woman's right to choose, you know, to take life. And it's like, isn't that interesting that you don't like it when God plays God. Right. Um, but you think that you could play God. Mm -hmm. At least he has the ability not only to take life, but to restore life. And so there's, there's kind of a major inconsistency there with uh, right. sort of an, a naturalistic uh, worldview there. Mm -hmm. Bin Laden, do you, that wasn't a question, I just thought about it when you were talking. Um, because when you said we, we try to preserve life, like they could have preserved his life, I'm assuming. Do you think that was a good move that they didn't? Well, what you've got to understand is a lot of these guys, like Bin Laden and other terrorists, will, will wear suicide vests on them. And so they're basically rigged, ready to blow the moment you okay. turn the corner. And, and so uh, they had to definitely believe that there's very high probability. In fact, you know, Rob O'Neill came out, who you know, was the guy that, that, that shot uh, Bin Laden. He says that he was pretty much convinced that they're going to go in there and they weren't going to come out alive, but they're going to get him you know, in the process. Uh, because these guys not only rig themselves to blow, but they'll rig the whole building to blow. Okay. Um... Okay, you just said something. Oh, I've lost my. That's why it's time. important. That was why it's important for him to get a, a headshot on him. You know, that way, if he shot in the body, he would have time to not only blow up, you know, those guys in the room, but blow up everybody right. uh, within the building. That was it. The guy who um, shot Bin Laden. He came out with a book recently. Is that correct? Someone. That was one of the questions. Uh, what do you think about that? He t told his story, and supposedly the seals are very. You don't. You don't do that. And he did. Yeah, it's a tight-knit group, and, you know, we're all about uh, secrecy and, and not really going out and sharing all the details. But if you mm -hmm. think about it, uh, he didn't really compromise the SEAL teams at all because he's not sharing anything that's not really already out there in okay. a way. I mean, what do we know about bin Laden? Well, we know that the SEAL teams took bin Laden out. We know of SEAL Team 6 that took bin Laden out. How do we know that? Well, it first came out, you know, our, our vice president, Joe Biden, he brought it up at an event. And then the president, uh, he brought it up at another event. Right. And so the way that we know SEAL Team 6 took out Osama bin Laden is not because of Rob O'Neill or any other SEAL. It's because of our vice president and president. They're really the ones, if you think about it, that, that pushed SEAL Team 6 out there into the arena. Right. And so he's not bringing anything new to the table about a team. If anything, 
if anyone's being compromised, it's not the team, he's compromising himself. He's putting himself in a situation where he could be at risk. But oh, you look yeah, at the true. logic as to why he did that, uh, he's revealed for a couple reasons. Number one, uh, he wanted to uh, help those that were mourning uh, family members that died in 9-11. In okay. He wanted to bring some closure to them. Because, you know, we, we got those whack jobs out there that say things like, well, we never really landed on the moon. And, right. you know, 9-11 was an inside job. Bin Laden was never really killed. You right. know, so how do we know? At least he could bring some closure and say, look, we really got the guy. I'm one of the guys that did it. But not only that, I think this is the bigger and more important reason is that he already believed that his name was imminently going to be released. And the reason okay. was because his name had already leaked out to three different places. Number one, guys in the SEAL teams knew who he was. All right, he's kind of safe there. Worse than that, though, congressmen uh, began to get his name. And then even beyond that, there's different news agencies that had gotten his name. And so really, it was just a matter of time. His name was going to be released. Right. And so you can't really blame the guy for releasing his name on his own terms. Right. Far better be on his own terms rather than get caught off guard by surprise while he's, you know, walking around in an airport somewhere and all of a sudden there's his name, you know, at least now he's prepared. Right. So if it's going to happen, it might as well happen on his own terms. Was there any backlash from your book? Like I never got any backlash from any other team guys because they see the things that I write about, you know, and they know, all right, he didn't, he didn't expose any of the real right. nitty gritty secret stuff that would put us in a dangerous situation. Right. Okay, uh, we talked a little bit, of, and someone's question was um, about Scott Halverson's body. Uh, th this was one we didn't go over because I just saw it up here. Did the United States retrieve his body? Did we get it back? Yes, they did. Uh, in fact, uh, it, it was called a surge of Fallujah. There was a lot of Marines that went in, and, and many of them gave their lives in the process just really to go in there and to not leave uh, these men behind. So they, they okay. literally risked it all, gave their lives in the process, and, and, and fought to the death. Uh, going to retrieve uh, the bodies of, of Scott, and there's, there's three other guys uh, over there as well. They're all private contractors that were ambushed in that vehicle. Okay. I asked him to, at lunch, if um, Scott, if he knew if Scott was a, a, a Christian, if he had, and he, you didn't think so, but you said that he was reading his Bible or something. And so That's right. Well, well and Scott, while we were friends, I wasn't a Christian, and right. so we didn't really have that conversation. Um, we did talk about God, I remember one time, though. I mean, I always was a believer in God. Mm -hmm. I knew Jesus was very important. I almost picked it like, you know, I'm, well, I'm on Team Jesus, if anything, right? So I told him, you know, like, Jesus is the only way. As long as I can do whatever I want to do. Yeah, right? you just, I was like, look, the only, the only way to get into heaven is going to be through Jesus. So you acknowledge that, you got a good heart, you're good to go, you know, and so... At least that was a little bit of a spiritual conversation at the time. Obviously, I needed more, and uh, he needed more. Uh, but interestingly, he started to actually sleep with a, a Bible by his bedside. Okay. That's what was shared with me. And oh, so, that's good. And I think that you have stories in the Bible, like the thief on the cross, mm -hmm. uh, just really as a witness to us to show us that, look, the Lord you know, could save somebody even in their last dying moments if they call out to him. And so uh, that's what you got to really hope on, you know, yeah. is that... The Lord gave him another opportunity, you know, and open his eyes. None of this stuff catches God by surprise. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, you just got to hope that the yeah. Lord gave him an opportunity to call out to him. And so I certainly do hope to see him again. Uh, after you got saved, did you quit drinking altogether? Or did you still drink a little bit and then that was, it was the question? It was just a 100%. All in. Yeah, all in. Leave it behind. You know, that cake, I had that cake of beer that I forgot about. I literally forgot about it. Yeah, two years that was later, interesting to me. Yeah. Two years later, later, cleaning out the garage. I hit, yeah. hit it so well, you know, under these blankets. Yeah. We stumbled across <laughs> it. And, I bet your dad just left. I was place. lost for words. He, he, he was like, <laughs> I got a funny story to share with you about that night Aww. I went to church. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's cute. Um, let's see, have you ever thought about being a military chaplain? I did give that some thought, and uh, I talked to the chaplains uh, that, you know, I had around me. And, you know, what they'd share with me basically is they say, look, chat, you know, our, our hands are kind of tied behind our mm -hmm. backs. You actually have more freedom uh, just as a regular enlisted guy to share the gospel, you know, with your platoon mates than I do. Basically, the conversation has to be invited. You know, like right. if you wanted to share the gospel with somebody in the platoon, they have to say, hey, uh, look, chap, you know, I'm kind of interested in this. Why don't you tell me a little bit about it? Whereas I could just go up to any one of my platoon mates and I could just start that conversation. Right. And then one of the other things he brought to me is that he says, you know, another thing is that, uh, you know, like for instance, if, if a Muslim wanted uh, some Islamic material, 
I actually have to be the guy that goes out and, and pulls these things together and, and gets it. I have to provide these things, you know, for him. And that doesn't yeah. mean that he has to teach it to him, but he has to be a provider of these things. And so he's just saying that he's, he's got some more obstacles. He's got his mm -hmm. hands tied behind his back a little bit more than a regular enlisted guy does. No doubt about it, there's a need, you know, for right. these chaplains there. And, you know, there's chaplains that, you know, they don't exactly, you know, follow the rules right to the, right. the line. They see those opportunities where they could share and they risk it and they, they go for it. But I just saw that, you know what, I'll have a lot more freedom to share mm -hmm. the gospel. As an enlisted guy, I stayed in for three and a half years still. Right. I had three and a half years to serve after I became a Christian. Um, okay. And so I used that opportunity to, you know, to share with my guys. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was really looking forward to that opportunity to breaking out of that, you know, that small sphere of influence, the 16 guys that I'm always around to, you know, getting out, you know, across the nation and being able right. to share the gospel with people all over whenever I can get a chance. Uh, can a, can woman be, a woman be a military chaplain was someone's question? I've, I've no, I've, I don't know. I've never noticed one, and that's a good question I don't know the answer to. Okay. I've never seen one. Um, why did you decide to leave the SEALs? Lots of questions like that. Sure, yeah. Um, my plan was to be a SEAL for a full career. And, you know, that, that night that everything changed when I became a Christian, one of the things I instantaneously knew, and this wasn't me, this is totally from the Lord, because this is not my plan before, is that I want to share the gospel just like that guy on stage does. Mm -hmm. And so immediately I knew that, wow, that means that when it's my chance to re-enlist again, because I'd already re-enlisted for a little bit of time initially for four years, and then I upped it to uh, just over six years, I thought when my time comes up uh, you know, again, uh, that'll be when I get out and I want to go get into full-time ministry. And so the time that I have left, I'll faithfully serve that commitment. And it's a time of preparation as well. It's an opportunity for me to share with the guys around me, but I'm going to get out into ministry and do what I'm doing right now. You know, mm -hmm. and so I just know yeah. this is what the Lord would have me do. How did people react? Like you, you went home you're, and you're like partying, drinking, and then you come back as a SEAL and you're like, oh, by the way, guys, I'm not doing that anymore. Uh, how well did that go for I'll you? never forget. You know, when I went back, and I told the guys, and I knew this was going to be a little bit difficult for me to do. There's just something about it. It's, um, you know, <laughs> accountability is, I, I, it, it was hard for me to do, but I did it. I said, hey, guys, I need you all to know something. They're like, yeah. I'm like, I became a Christian last night. And they're like, okay, good for you, Williams. You know, like, all right. You know, so I think that they didn't take it totally seriously. Right. I mean, when some of these guys, you know, we're a wild bunch of guys. Yeah. But even some of these wild guys are telling me, dude, you need to cool it a little bit, you know? So okay. I think for some of them, they thought this would be fruitful. They're like, yeah, he needs a sort of spiritual cleansing, man. This guy's going through a crazy phase. But right. what happened was is I, I, they began to see I really took to it. You know? right. And so then they began to go, all right, what happened to the old Chad? We want the old Chad back. Where did he go? A lot of you people know? wanted the old Chad back, it sounds like. Yeah. <laughs> Aubrey's like, I want the old Chad back. And so there's a lot of camaraderie there. Professionally speaking, there's the, the job that you do, but there's a lot of time that you do outside of the job where you're just getting out with the guys, going to the bars, and, and just shooting it up. And, and so I wasn't really going to be doing that. And I wasn't drinking anymore. I decided I'll be designated driver for these guys. But... You know, that wasn't ever enough for them. They're like, I bought you this drink, now drink it. And eventually it began to get very upsetting to them, you know, yeah. that I wasn't, you know, doing the same things that they were doing. And so that's where that sort of like, it can be like a mean family sometimes. It could really turn on you. Right. Yeah. And so they're like, yeah, if you can't go into this strip club and look at a naked woman, how do I know you could shoot somebody if you need to? I'm just like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that does I make a lot of sense. I can explain this, but it's not going to make sense to you. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Oh, that's cute. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, why do you feel that leaving the SEALs was the right thing to do? I think you pretty much already said that. Um, because I think some people were thinking that maybe by you staying would show, you know, the SEALs need Jesus too. Absolutely. And I've met a lot of these young guys that are, are going in. They've actually, you know, read my book and they've made it through SEAL training and they're oh. firm believers going in. And what I've shared with them is there's no doubt about it. God calls, you know, Christian men to go into the SEAL teams. Mm -hmm. What I want young men to really make sure of is that this is something that the Lord is calling them to do and not something that's just a personal desire of theirs right. and then they're making it a God thing. Right. You know, I think the majority of young guys are kind of like that. Mm -hmm. And so I, but there's no doubt that God definitely calls Christian men uh, to be in that place because they do need uh, Christians. And so in a way, it's sort of like a, a passing of the torch. It's not like I was bailing on something. It's like 
I wanted to be a SEAL for a full career. Right. And something God did was he implanted, you know, really a, a change in me. And so, I, you know, I, I finished the time, you know, that I had left. But I knew that he has called me to a different uh, thing. Right. Now, tonight we'll have a lot of um, high school and college kids here. And, I, I, you know, the world looks so inviting to them right now. And, you know, you're in high school and you're in college and you're like, but everyone's smoking pot and everyone's drinking and everyone's doing, you know, and how do you... Tell them, like, that's so empty. You've been there. You've done that. Well, and my son is here. Where are you, Dusty? There you are. Yeah. This, so talk to my son. Not that he wants to do any of those things, but before he even thinks about it, I'd like for you to share with him. <laughs> I think the best thing you could do is just really share the truth with them, you know, and it's, it's really going to be a work of God that, that breaks through. Praying for them behind the scenes, I have no doubt that, you know, God hears our prayers. Sometimes he's just waiting for us to ask. You know, because, you know, that's just the means. Our prayer is the means to his ends. Mm -hmm. He'll pull it off. No doubt about it, my parents' prayers, you know, were heard. Right. And, uh, that that's was all I could really chalk it up to is like, wow, you know, like God really answered my parents' prayers because I, I couldn't, I couldn't, you know, I didn't, wasn't on any kind of spiritual path that, that right. led me to that place. But a lot of guys are like me, you know, and they, they, they got to learn for themselves sort of the hard way. And it's so dumb. And, you know, now... I like to take what I call shortcuts in life. If somebody that's, you know, a little older than me can shed a little bit of wisdom on something, you know, I'll, I'll take it, you know, because that's, it just launches you forward faster, you know, in, in life. But um, at the time when I was younger, I just had to learn the hard way by, uh, by making my own mistakes. Not that that, you know, not that that should be acceptable, but I mean, what could you do? Right. You could just share the truth with them. And, and so... You know, the scriptures say that we're just to raise our children, you know, uh, following the Lord. So as long as you're sharing the word with them, you're planting that seed, and you just trust the Holy Spirit will really be another parent to them, you know, to right. guide them. Can, can Dusty put your phone number on speed dial on his phone? <laughs> okay, what was the hardest psychological thing you had to overcome? Did we say this already? No. So I, I guess, you know, aside from like the whole SEAL training aspect of things, because Hell Week is pretty pressing, it's probably the hardest like physical, mental thing I ever went through, and that's really the whole goal of it, is that you're going to go through something that will be more difficult than anything that you ever have to go through in life, so that it's always uh, a point in life you could look back on and say, I went through that, I could do this. Okay. So they right. want to bring you as, as close to just the real deal brink of death. You know, they literally have charts laid out that says this is how long it is humanly possible to leave this guy in the water given the water temperature and the time of exposure. Here's how long we need to pull him out before he starts going through hypothermia. Here's when we can put him back in. And you wow. learn that the human body really can do like 20 times what you thought it could do. I mean, when you feel like I am going to die, the instructors say, trust us. We are not going to kill you. All right. Right. And you could go a lot farther than you think. And That's they show you that you could do a lot more than you ever thought. And so uh, that definitely was just uh, physically and mentally grinding. And then probably one of the most difficult things, though, after that, after becoming a, a Christian, was, you know, just really having my legs kicked out from under me when I, when I lost that relationship that I thought was going to last forever, yeah. you know, with, with Aubrey. Yeah. I, I was totally ready to marry her. And then... It's like, wow, this is just this yeah. is not happening at all. And that was definitely a huge test. But uh, I'm glad I, I came through. I was like, hey, Lord, I'm not going to bail on you. Right. You know, I'm not going to leave you now and say, oh, you took away my girl. Now I'm leaving you. It's like, that's a test, you know. Yeah. And, and so the Lord, he never leaves us nor forsakes us. And like I shared earlier, you know, yeah, in this life you will have trouble. But Christ says, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Right. You know, there's nothing too great for him. You know, apart mm -hmm. from him, we could do nothing, but with him, all things really are possible. Has anyone ever died in SEAL training? Yes. Lots? Handful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a, just a few classes before, before mine. You know, there's a guy that literally ran himself to death. You will never catch me running myself to death. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like, I, I'm supposed to be walking like three miles a day, and that happens about once every two weeks. So, yeah, that's not going to be my problem. I had a, I had a good friend that uh, I went through buds with, and uh, this is good, not a question, but this I think this is a good lesson, too. Um, his name is Alex Gagne. And when I went through buds, I wasn't a Christian. I became a Christian while I was in the teams. And so this guy saw me a certain way before. We went our separate ways into different teams, and now I hadn't seen him for like a year and a half or two. We run into each other. Hey, how you doing? You know, and we're catching up. And uh, I let him know. I felt compelled. Like, hey, let him know you became a Christian. So I was like telling him, like, hey, man, I, I, I became a Christian. 
And he's like, oh, you know, right on. You know, good for you. And I think he could tell that, you know, something was, was different there. And then I felt compelled to share the gospel with them. I felt right. like, hey, share the gospel with them, Chad. You know, and, and for some reason I wasn't. I was holding back. And I, I think that we've all probably felt that compelling mm -hmm. before where we, we know we should, but we just don't. Right. And it was just eating at me. Just do it. Just do it. And the opportunity was there, but I, I just wasn't doing it because I was nervous. Right. And I, I kept looking then for a spot in the conversation to do it. That opportunity was fading, and, and now the topic shifted onto something else, and I kind of comforted myself with this thought of, you know what, I'll just share it with him next time I see him. Uh, so he was going to go off to this uh, shooting school in Mississippi called Shaw's, which is like the premier shooting school in the whole U.S., so the SEAL teams go there. I had just gotten done there, and so I'm just like, all right, I'll just tell him about Shaw's. You're going to have a great time. See you when you get back. And, you use live rounds when you're over there and you're shooting right by your buddies. You know, we train like we fight. You know, we train with live rounds right next to each other. And uh, after these guys were over there for a while, they're just about to come back home just a few days away. We get word that one of the guys uh, had gotten shot. Uh, that uh, round went through a wall that's supposed to catch bullets. It went through that wall. He had full-on wraparound body armor on. There's only really one vulnerable place, and that would be the armpit. That's like the one place where you're not really covered. His arm happened to be up. The round passed through his armpit and, and through his heart. And he died on the way to the hospital. I'm like, Lord, please don't let that be Alex. I was supposed to share the gospel with him. I know I was supposed to share the gospel with him. And I told myself I'd do it when he got back. And it turned out to be him. Aww. And so this was just really a lesson that I learned in blood, you know, is that, you know, don't, don't quench the work of the Holy Spirit. You know, yeah. when the Holy Spirit's working, don't put out the flames. You know, I should have, I should have shared the gospel with them uh, there right. at, at that time. And so, uh, and then, you know, what, what could you do from there? Well, just learn that lesson the way I learned it the hard way. My, my thing was, you know, now is that whenever I feel compelled to share the gospel with somebody, I'm going to do, do it. it yeah. Just do it. Yeah. yeah. And so hopefully you folks learn that lesson, you know, through really a mistake that I made. Right. Um, a lot of, uh, I can never say the right, PTSD. Um, what do you do when you know somebody who has that? Post traumatic, you told me what it was, post? Yeah. Post traumatic stress disorder. There you go. And so, I mean, if you look at it, there's these guys that, you know, on the battlefield, they have seen things that most people will never see, horrific things. It's traumatic stress. And so it's the after effect, the post, post traumatic stress. Uh, you know, these guys could be, say, at, at Disneyland having a good time with their family, and then a balloon pops, and it takes them right back to that, that traumatic time where maybe they see some of their best friends dying in front of them, and it really just disorients them and, and turns their whole world upside down. And uh, so really, I, w I would think that the only thing, see, I, I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't, I've never experienced PTSD, but, you know, I know people uh, that have. And so I think that the only thing that could really settle that storm that's going on, really, in their mind, in their life, uh, would be Christ. You right. know, that just as, you know, Peter was able to walk on water in the midst of a storm so long as he fixed his eyes on Christ, and it's when his eyes jotted away, when he took his eyes off the Lord, that's when he began to sink again. Right. And so I think that's how it is in, in life as, as well. There's no just like, set it and forget it, we could fix it. We're constantly to be relying on mm -hmm. Christ. And if you look at Christ, you know, here he is. He was, he was beaten down. Uh, he was messed up, but he was never totally out of the fight. And that's how it is. You know, a lot of these guys, they are, they are beaten up, you know, but they're not totally out of the fight. They've got Christ, you know. Right. So apart from him, we could do nothing. But with Christ, all things truly are possible. We're to fix our eyes on him. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. And, uh, you know, there will be a day when we finally have rest. That's yeah. what it is going to be in heaven. But while we're here, it's a work. It's probably just like anything, like, hi, I suffer from depression, or I suffer from, it's just, you've got to learn how to fix your eyes on, on Jesus in order to get that better, I would assume, is what, you know. All right, uh, what, how long was the average time of service as a Navy SEAL? I'd say the average time is uh, about 10 years, right around there. Most guys will uh, kind of do the six-year thing that I did. And then the reason they do another four, really, you know, there's a real big bonus that they try and throw your way to hook you. Yeah. And then once they've got you for 10, pretty much everyone that does 10, they say, well, it'd be foolish for me to not finish out and do another 10. You do know, they make more money as they 
as they re-enlist you? The way it was for me is they, they throw a $90,000 bonus at you. You re-enlist, we'll give you $90,000. But for me, I was like... 90000 90. 90, okay. I was like, you could offer me a million dollars. <laughs> I'm not going I'm back. I'm supposed to do. Yeah. It's not that I don't like it. I loved it. I love getting paid to shoot guns, blow things up, and jump out of airplanes. <laughs> but it's like I knew that the Lord had something else for me to do. And so right. I, I had to stick to that. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Okay, someone has a question about everything that's going on in the Middle East. You've seen it. How accurate is the news? Like when we see what's going on with every, you know, is it one little, like we always look at Egypt, and it's like I always say, well, it's probably like 10 people, and the media's standing there with cameras, and the rest of Egypt's fine, but just that, you know, is that how, or is it really a big problem? Oh, it's definitely really a big problem. Okay, so the, the media yeah. is, so the if we see on the media. It's very chaotic, yeah. absolutely. Um, you know, when certain people, you know, maybe certain media outlets try and say, you know, it's about oil or whatever, and there's no real mm -hmm. evil that we're up against out there, it's like, hey, you know, I've seen it firsthand. You know, they say, oh, you, know, you know, there's no real jihadists, it's just a very few amount of people or whatever. It's like, hey, it's a very real problem. You know, if we don't deal with it over there, what's going to happen is you could just put that problem off to the side and act like it's not there. You can go on living your life here in America and, you know, for you know, a certain amount of time, you might not ever see the effects of it. But just like a ripple effect, it's eventually going to come over here. So yeah. you got to deal with it over there before it starts, you know, coming in, you know, to your own nation. There are very evil men out there. I've been face to face with them that would uh, celebrate the opportunity to chop your head off. And that's just because yeah. of their crazy belief. You know, mm -hmm. that they're to go after infidels, kill them wherever they find them. And that, that's them taking the Quran seriously, not extrapolating it. I mean, that's what it is to really be a follower mm -hmm. of, of Islam, right? Is if they won't submit, then you, you know, chop off their hands and chop off their heads. And, you know, I've seen this stuff. So there's definitely very real evil uh, that is overseas. And so it's always great when they'll let guys that actually had boots on the ground get on, you know, different uh, programs. So I've been on CNN at least a half a dozen times, and I've been on Fox News uh, pretty close to the same amount of times. And so, yeah, I'm, they let me. They, they've they've never cut me off. They've let me okay. share, you know, you know, my perspective of things. And so, I can only speak on that. Really, that's great. I'm very appreciative that they've they've never cut me off, and I've gotten to share, yeah. you know, what I've seen and, and, and done. Is ISIS here? Do you think? Well, you know, I, I wouldn't say in an organized way, right? But it, it's probably just around the corner if you don't do something to try and dismantle them. Right. Uh, there's definitely people that are sympathetic to their views. So there's individuals out there that could just pop up out of anywhere and say, I'm going to do something for them, right? right? Um, are we doing any good over there? Like, by, I know we have some air campaigns going on. I don't watch the news a lot. Uh, are, are we making a dent in their organization, do you think, or not really? I'd say... When we were pulling troops out of Iraq, right, I always thought, all right, it's, we're not really pulling everybody out. You know? right. That was one thing. I was like, we're not really pulling everyone out. They're doing that just to make the American people happy. Of course we're leaving some guys for it deployed over there to keep everything stable. Well, it turns out we didn't. You know? oh, <laughs> so okay. Had we done that, I believe everything would have stayed stable, okay. you know, relatively stable. You know, so they really did pull It's almost like them. an incurable cancer is the way I look at it. And you right. can go through treatment. You can go through chemotherapy treatment, and it, 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 it wipes out you know, some of the, the bad. Uh, but it's going to continue, continuously flare up. So you continually got to keep treating it. But if you just look the other way and you don't deal with it, it's going to fester out of control. And that's right. what happened. And so unfortunately, there's these guys that have literally laid down their lives and paid the highest price they could mm -hmm. possibly pay you know, their blood on the battlefield. Uh, you know, to uh, really retain an, an area, and, and now that area has been given up. And so that's really the most unfortunate thing. It's not just how much money resource-wise has been wasted, but, you know, the, can you put a dollar amount, you know, on the blood that was right. shed uh, t to spread freedom into those areas? So we should have never completely pulled out. And so we're kind of right back to where we started almost. We're going to have to have guys on the, on the ground. Ultimately, we're going to have yeah. to have guys on the ground to do what we did before, get it back to where we had it before, and never completely take them all out of there. Is ISIS a new group, or like, is it just under a different name than when you were there? Uh, I think they've been around for you know, quite a while. I can't put you know, a number of years on it. It was never really something that we were looking at while I was over there. I know that it was something stirring up really in, in Syria. Right. Uh, but you know, it's just uh, it's the same, you know, really, it's the same Islamic jihadist with just a, another different name, name on it. On it. Yeah. Okay. Um, also, uh, Hollywood, their portrayal of Zero Dark Thirty, 
uh, Black Hawk Down, I'm going to assume Lone Survivor. Yeah, I use a couple uh, do they of portray the recent, pretty recent good? examples. Like uh, Act of Valor, um, uh, they actually used active duty Navy SEALs uh, I to thought I really read that someplace. in that, you know. And so that was actually kind of sort of a good recruitment tool, you know, yeah. for guys who get interested uh, in the SEAL teams. Um, for Lone Survivor, you know, they actually had Marcus Luttrell, the Lone Survivor, on mm -hmm. set along with a lot of other SEALs. I know one of the other SEALs that was on set there. And uh, the director actually gave these guys uh, the ability to, in the middle of a battle scene, you know, no matter how much pyro and money was being used, if they ever saw anything that was off or wrong or just wouldn't be that way, any one of these guys could just say, cut, oh, and wow. stop it. Okay. You know, and, and then go over it again. And so as Marcus, has, I've seen him say in an interview, you know, and I'd say it's pretty accurate that it is as close to a real gunfight as you could portray a gunfight without actually making it a real gunfight. Gun yeah, yeah, so... They did a good job. I didn't want to go see it, and I think I ended up seeing it two or three times. Like, I loved it. I, I don't like, ah, guns and fighting and war and stuff like that. Um, would you, let's see, did we already ask you this? Would you be a SEAL again? Yeah, I mean. If God called you, I would. If I went it. back, you know, and would I do it all again? Absolutely. Um, right. You know, where I'm at right now, I, I know I'm, I'm supposed to be. You know? Right. So it's, so it's not an option really yeah. for you. Um, how do you feel about the author? Oh, wait, I think we already talked about him. No Ordinary Day. He's the one that we were talking about. Okay. And then what else? Um, this is an interesting question. I think it goes off of Aubrey here. Uh, do you think Catholics are going to heaven? That's you a have a fun question. time answering that. Yeah, I think that uh, really the best answer to give to that is I believe that there are uh, some people in the Catholic pews, as it were, uh, that really do have a relationship with Christ. And okay. the thing is that they're in the wrong place, and they need to get some real, you know, biblical teaching. Because what the Catholic Church teaches is really contrary to what a lot of, quote-unquote, Catholics believe. So I come across this on the street all the time. Somebody says, I'm a Catholic. I go, okay, well... You believe in works righteousness. You believe that you have to do certain things to get mm -hmm. to heaven. And they'll be like, no, I don't. They're like, yeah. no, yeah, you do. They're like, that's not what I believe. And I'll be like, okay, well, that's what the Catholic Church teaches. So that's great. You don't believe what the Catholic Church teaches because you know, right. the scriptures say that we're saved by grace through faith and that not of ourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works as any man should boast. Right. Uh, it also says that you know, we have direct access to God through his son Jesus. You don't need to be praying through saints. And I'll meet some of these Roman Catholics and say, well, I don't pray to saints. You know, I pray to God directly. It's like, that's great. This is, this, these are good indicators here, but you're in the wrong place. Right. And so I think that there's a lot of false, there is definitely false teaching within the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. but no doubt about it, there are some people within the pews that could have a right relationship with Christ, uh, and they need to get out of there you right. know, as soon as possible. Yeah. No, and that's a really hard one because there's a lot of you know, a lot of people that come here that are Catholics too, and it's hard. To, I always bring up the sacraments. You know, like you have to feel like you have to do this, and you're told to do this and that. And it is a very, very workspace. But we know some of those wonderful people that are Catholics, and it's hard to, for them to break. But a lot of it is tradition, and I feel like they may know Christ, but they also somehow like the tradition of it all. So it's kind of that. There's a balance there of do I really know Christ or whatever, you know? Yeah, and what you have within the Catholic Church really is sort of an evolution of man kind of having a, his, his bent on religion. You have these different popes that succeed one another, and each of them sort of puts his own sort of uh, customized sort of twist to things, and eventually what happens over the course of 2,000 years is they get so far away from what really traditional Christianity is. Right. And so that's what they need to be cautious of. Yeah. Good answer. Wow, that was you and not me. <laughs> Can you talk about the false converts in the church today? What do you think about them? Well, you know, Jesus, he, he said it himself. It shouldn't come as a surprise to us. You know, he says that there will be tares amongst the wheat. You know, we know what a, a tear is. It's a weed that looks very much like, you know, a, a grain of wheat on the outside. The way you tell the difference is to break it open and look on the inside. And, you know, he was saying that, look, they're going to be, you know, amongst you. Even Jesus had his Judas, Right. right. Um, so the, the best that we could do is just, you know, realize the fact that there are a lot of people within our church that with their lips they worship him, but, you know, inwardly, you know, they, they really are not true followers of hers, that his, and uh, they just need to be exposed really to the truth more, and we're supposed to, as their brother and sisters, try and pull them in. Right. You know, I know that at the, at the end of the book of James, it says that we're supposed to really be pursuing these people and winning them over to the Lord. And so I think there's a difference between somebody that's a, a, a hypocrite 
You know? Yeah. I mean, there's the, everyone's a hypocrite, at least to some right. degree. I think I've heard like Walter Martin say, hey, we got room for one more. Right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at least to some degree, somebody could be called out, you know, as a hypocrite. And, and so the Christian is not the self-righteous one. They're the first one to admit, you know, really just how spiritually depraved they are in and of themselves. Right. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for mm -hmm. theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In and of myself, I'm, I'm wicked, I'm rotten, I'm a sinner in constant need of a savior. Right. Uh, but that person that uh, just takes on the name of Christ and then in intentionally goes out, you know, in, in a lifestyle and a pattern of sin, you know, just rotten fruit coming from them, um, you know, they need to be saved, right? And so right. we need to do the best we can to be a, an influence on them. And sometimes that's tough love. You know, I know right. that in First Corinthians, uh, you know, Paul points out that if anyone names themselves uh, a believer, you know, but they continue on, he was talking about sexual sin, he says, basically, you know, cast them out. Right. Cast them out to be delivered unto Satan in hopes that, you know, they'll basically come mm -hmm. running back. And so it says not to even associate or eat with such a person, but he didn't mean to not eat or associate with anybody that is caught up in sexual morality that is not a Christian. He says, otherwise, you'd have to go out of the world, you know, right. you'd have to get out of here. So sometimes that's, that's tough love that we got to do. Iron okay. sharpens iron, and when that happens, you know, sparks fly. Mm. Well, and the problem, too, is people are like, who are you to judge me? What, what, what right do you have? You know what I mean? So it becomes a, so I think Christians are like, well, I can't really judge, you know, but there's this whole thing of. Yeah, but you well, can. In John seven twenty four, it says, judge righteously. And so what we're not supposed to do, Matthew uh, 7, it says, you know, judge not, lest ye be judged for the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Well, with the measure that I use, if I'm judging righteously, I sure hope it gets measured back to me. Right. If I'm calling somebody out for being a liar, I sure hope that they would do the same for me as well. Mm -hmm. And so what we're not to do is we're not, Matthew 7 is talking about don't judge hypocritically according to your own standard. John uh, 7, 24 says that we ought to judge righteously, which is not according to my own standard, but holding somebody accountable to a righteous standard, God's standard. And so when we hold others accountable to the standard of the scriptures, I sure hope they would hold me accountable to it as well. Right. And in that sense, I can judge, I can examine, you know, the, mm -hmm. the fruit that they have in their lives because we are supposed to be fruit examiners. Do you go to people and say, hey, I, you're being whatever? I mean, do you, do you call them out on it? That's the biblical equation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if an individual sinning against you, go to that person, mm -hmm. you know, privately. If you see them in sin, go to them privately. If they won't listen to you, bring another person, you right. know, with you as another witness. If they won't listen to you, you know, hey, bring it before, you know, the church. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the, the biblical equation that you're supposed to go with. Um, it's almost like if you don't do something, yeah, it's easier not to point it out, but that's like the doctor that sees that, wow, this person has a uh, serious disease and it leads to death, but I'm not gonna say I don't want to have that conversation yeah. with them because everything's going great right now, you know, and that's right. really going to make things bad. But it's like, right. hey, there's a cure available, right? There's certain treatments this person can go through. So you've got to share the tough truth with them sometimes in order to be a real friend. Right. They say it's your, your enemy stab you in the back, but your friend stab you in the front. Right. You know, and you want to be surrounded by those people that aren't oh, just yes point. men. You know, the people that will, they'll tell you when you're off. Right. Homosexuality is a big thing now. It's not a question, I'm just asking you. So how do you, um, you know, so you've got someone that you know, that because a lot of people now say, well, I go to a church, and my pastor's gay, and everything's fine, and we believe that it's okay. I mean, it's yeah, just, just a matter it's of... Not, it's not really possible for your, pastor, for your pastor to truly be a pastor, a man that teaches the Word of God, you know, and, He's not being accurate when in Romans chapter 1, it makes it very crystal clear in the context of it all that homosexuality is, is a sin numbered amongst other sins that is deserving of judgment, and God will judge it. And so it says, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which is due. And it says, likewise, uh, women, you know, uh, leaving the natural use, you know, burning in their lust for one another. And, and it says that God will give them over to a debased mind. So it's sin. And uh, we don't only really know that it's sin, we know why it's sin. You know, we can see why it's sin. It's because, again, it goes against the natural design. Right. You know, we literally were not made to function that way. Right. So maybe they have a certain feeling, but, you know, just look at the average age of a homosexual male. It's 41 years old. Oh. And the reason it's 41 years old is because of all the disease that comes from that type of lifestyle. And, and that's excluding the uh, AIDS. Factor, right. right. If you include AIDS as one of those things that takes their lives, it's 39 years old. 
That's the, that's wow. the average age of a homosexual male because it's destructive to the human body. The human right. body is literally not made to be used that way. It's not how God made it. Just like taking that iPhone and shoving it under a door and it'd be used as a doorstop, it's destructive to it, and it goes against the design, the intent, the nature of who we are as human beings. Right. And so, yeah, there's a lot of people that have twisted thoughts, forget about homosexuality, but even just heterosexuals, right? Um, you know, that's their sin that they need to deal with and right. repent of, right? And so, you know, for homosexuals that want to practice that lifestyle, they need to bring that before God. Say, God, help me. I repent of it. It's not like they're beyond being saved. Right. Right? And I can understand if uh, someone was a homosexual, they were a practicing homosexual, they realize these things are sin according to the scriptures, but they still fight that temptation just like a heterosexual male that realizes that having sex outside of marriage is sinful, and yet they still battle with the feeling of lust. It's, it's acting upon it. Right. It's not the bait, it's the bite, right? Okay. Uh, you know, it, it, temptation is one thing, acting on it is a whole nother thing, all right? And so if they're battling with it, but they're bringing it before God, you know, they're not beyond God's grace. God right. certainly can save them. And so I know there's certain men out there that will say, you know, that I am oriented, like I, I am, they'll, they'll say. I was born this way. They'll say I'm born <laughs> this way, they'll say I'm oriented this way, but they're not practicing it. And that's right. an important thing right there. I think every man can say, I was born this way to uh, want to go after every set of legs that walks by, right? But I'm not practicing it, you know, right. I'm resisting that. Right. Make sense? <laughs> kind of. Kind of. <laughs> okay, moving on. Um, let's talk about, uh, you referenced Second Kings. Uh, Elijah and the prophets is a good question. In the, law, in the Bible, there are lots of stories of prophets. And um, some, the question is, who is the prophet for our time, and how would you know if the person is a true prophet of God? Well, I think that kind of starts off with a false assumption that who is the prophet of our time that assumes there is supposed to be a prophet mm -hmm. uh, of our time. And there's a couple of different ways to think of a prophet. You know, in, in one sense, the Bible used to prophesy as just to proclaim truth that is already known. And so really, you're prophesying every time you share the gospel. You're proclaiming already revealed truth. And then there's prophecy where you uh, foretell what is about to happen. And I think that when we're you know, dealing with prophets on the scale of Elijah, or more specifically like the apostles, mm -hmm. that's sort of what we're thinking of here, like the 12. Right. You know, or you got you know, Paul as well, who's a very unique apostle to the Gentiles. Um, what do you look for? What's an indicator for them to be... On, on that part, you know, who's the successor of Peter and Paul, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd say there are none. It ended with those guys. Yeah. The, the foundation of the church is the uh, apostles, mm -hmm. and you only got to lay a foundation down once. Right. And they actually look for certain prerequisites for somebody to be an apostle in Acts chapter 1 when, when Judas uh, had betrayed Christ and went and committed suicide. They needed somebody to fill his position. And what they said, in order for them to fill his position, they had to be an eyewitness of the life and the teachings of Christ, starting from his baptism to his, uh, his uh, death and resurrection. And then they also need to be able to perform the signs and wonders of a prophet, like you see in 2 uh, Corinthians 12, 12. And so, well, that really narrows down the candidates, right? right? There's only so many men that were alive during that time that were around to see the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. And so it starts with those guys. It ends with those guys. Now we no longer have them walking around speaking the word of God because we have the word of God given to us and recorded to us. And uh, one of the clear cut ways that you could really you know, spot somebody uh, that is a false prophet is if they share something that's contrary to already revealed truth. Right. And that's really a principle that you see in Deuteronomy chapter 18. When there were more prophets to come during that time, I mean, very early on, one of the first five books of the Bible, there's more prophets to come. And uh, what the Lord was saying back then is basically if anyone declares a word in the name of the Lord and it does not come true, well, you know that they were a false prophet. Because right. if, if God really is declaring something, then it will happen. Right. If somebody claims that there's a mouthpiece for God, you know, but it doesn't really happen, there's an indicator that they're not really a mouthpiece for God. And one of the real clear things is when they go contrary to something that's already revealed. And so you got certain, uh, you know, cults out there, false belief systems, like, uh, you know, the Mormon church, they believe that there are, you know, succeeding prophets that, that go on, but look, they believe the Bible is the word of God, they'll say yes, 
Galatians 1, uh, chapter 8, verses, uh, uh, chapter 1, verses 8 through 9, uh, the apostles say, Even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach any other gospel to you other than that which you have already received, consider them accursed, and they repeat it, which is a big deal in the Hebrew mm -hmm. uh, language. Even, if, even as we have said before, so now we say again, if anyone preaches to you any other gospel other than that which we have already preached to you, consider that person a curse. In other words, they're saying, look, we've already put a cap on it. Right. This is it. If it changes, if anyone says, even if an angel from heaven should preach to you another gospel, don't believe it. Ironically, Joseph Smith believes that an angel by the name of Moroni came to him and shared with him a whole other version. You know, right. of Christianity, where Jesus came to the America. So it just would have done him good to go look back at his Bible and see yeah. that even Satan could masquerade himself as an angel of light, it says. Yeah. And so that's really the, 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 the two things that were looked for back then in the first century. Uh, you know, were they an eyewitness of the resurrected Christ? Did they perform signs and wonders? And the other thing is, are they teaching anything that's contrary to already revealed truth? Okay. So I don't think that we have any modern day uh, prophets on that level of, of, like, of an apostle uh, right. anymore. Yeah, I always say that at the Mormon church. I always say it wouldn't exist today if people back then actually read their Bible and studied just their Bible alone. Because then they'd go, oh, Galatians 1 says blah, blah, blah. It's amazing. Yeah, well, people will believe sometimes. It know, is other, kind of shocking. Other than the How truth. Time do we have? Yeah. Um, oh, we only have a few more minutes. Uh, talk about uh, the documentary movie 180. Uh, were you part of that? 180 degrees, yeah. is that what it is? Yeah, so a 180, it's uh, somebody having a, a change of mind. Okay. Like a 180 degree change of mind. Um, so when I worked with uh, Ray Comfort over at Living Waters, we're working on a documentary. And uh, as I recall, the name of it was supposed to be uh, God, uh, God, Hitler, and the Bible. And basically, Hitler claimed, in some sense, that he was a Christian. And that somehow what he was doing, you know, lined up with Christianity. And then other things he said on the other side of his mouth totally lined up with, you know, naturalism, atheism, survival of the fittest, wipe out, you know, this. So uh, Ray, he is uh, Jewish, you know, by blood, right? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. And uh, he obviously became a, a believer. Even Jesus was, you know, a Jew, right? Um, so he, it was important to him uh, to make sure that people don't forget uh, what happened over in uh, Nazi Germany. And what we had found is we were going on these college campuses and, and just real basic, just opener questions like, uh, you know, who was Adolf Hitler? And we were not expecting this. Tons of college students on a daily basis. We could go out on any given day and find at least a handful of students just in a few hours that would literally have no idea who Adolf Hitler was. Mm -hmm. I am not kidding you. I mean, even in the document, there's one guy I interviewed. I was like, who is Adolf Hitler? Microphone. He's like, uh... Was he an actor? Like, he does not know, right? right? And so the big concern is that history can repeat itself when people yeah. forget, you know, what had happened. So, Did you ever watch Waters World with Fo on Fox? No. He does the same thing. He goes around like, who's the president of the United States? I'm like, I have no idea. <laughs> it's kind of sad. Well, the thing was, these were never intended to be gotcha questions at all. Yeah. This is just like openers to kind of get the interview going. Right. And it's like, it was, it was very scary to mm -hmm. see just really how ignorant, you know, people were. Mm -hmm. And it's like, are they not teaching this anymore? Maybe they're not, no. I don't know. Yeah. And so uh, what Ray wanted to do is he wanted to, you know, shed some light, you know, on what had happened during that time so that it's not forgotten. And he also just wanted to expose the fact that, that Hitler was not a, a true follower of Jesus Christ. Right. Well, as we're doing this, um, one of the scenarios that we put people in, uh, it was just supposed to be a little add-on, a little extra, how... Uh, you know, what happened in, in Nazi Germany in the concentration camps and how Hitler just wiped out so many is very similar to what's happening today. There's almost like a modern Holocaust going on today. The screams are silent, unborn children, right? right? And so the way that Hitler justified that is he literally defined Jews out of existence. He put them on the same level as just being like animals. Well, they're not human, therefore we could wipe them out. And so we put people in a sort of what would you do sort of situation. You know, you go back to Nazi Germany and uh, you've got, you know, somebody that, that, you know, has got a machine gun pointed to your head and they say, we want you to bury these Jews in this pit. Some of them are still alive. Most of them are dead, but we want you to bury them. If you don't bury them, we'll kill you. We'll do it ourselves. But if you do do it, we'll let you live. What would you do? And the response that most people gave was, I wouldn't do it. It's like, really? You wouldn't do it. Why not? And they struggled to come up with an answer, but it, it would always come down to, I just, I wouldn't do it because it's not right, uh, because I, it's, I value human life. Oh, you value human life, okay. Oh, what do you think about abortion? And that's where they'd go, well, I believe it's a, 
a, a woman's right to choose, and that's where we point out, but isn't that exactly what Hitler did? He would define the Jews out of existence, and isn't that what we're doing today? We're trying to say that the unborn is not really an innocent human being okay. worthy of, of protection. And so they would literally, in the moment, they would catch the contradiction, and they would say, you know what? Yeah, I guess I, I, I believe differently about that. You know, I, I think that we shouldn't, we shouldn't be doing that. And so in a matter of seconds, they would be doing a 180 with their mind. Okay, so that's, so that's why the documentary, the, the name actually changed. And this is just supposed to be sort of like a, a little tail end extra in the documentary, just a similarity. And it literally, I mean, we're ready to wrap this thing up. And it became the whole documentary. The whole okay. documentary became 180, changing people's minds about abortion, uh, just showing them. Uh, just okay. how similar, you know, that was what Hitler was doing uh, back then to what we're doing today. And then sharing the gospel with these folks. And okay. so that's what 180 is all about. And you can go watch it on, online for free. You know, go YouTube, 180movie.com. You can find it. Okay. It's a great documentary. Yeah, good question. I'd never heard of it before. Um, was it hard for you to leave Aubrey when you left for the Navy? Did you ever worry she wouldn't be here when you came back? Now, were you still together at the time when you went into the SEAL boot camp? I'm trying to figure out timing-wise here. Yeah, so, I'm not, yeah, we I'm not really sure when, either. When I went into boot camp, yeah, yeah. we were okay. together. We were writing each other you know, okay, so every day. Okay, you, you yeah, weren't too, were you worried? I was, it looks from someone who uh, is interested in joining the Navy SEAL. So maybe he has yeah. a girlfriend. I don't know. Yeah, it's trust her. Trust her to yeah, God, right? a lot of heartache, you know, a lot of shed tears. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sending me letters with, like, sprayed with perfume. Oh. <laughs> I'd circle a little spot. That's where a tear dropped. <laughs> Running you back. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, we are so thankful that you came to hang out with us today. W tell everyone what you're doing right now. Like you're working with Harvest. Yeah, uh, I work with Greg so at my church. Uh, it's called Harvest. Uh, pastor Greg Laurie is the, the lead pastor over there. It's a pretty big church. It's got about 15,000 people. We've got multiple campuses. And we do a really big thing every year called Harvest America. And so folks can find out a whole lot more about what we're going to do for 2015 uh, at harvestamerica.com. Uh, but what it's all about really is crusade evangelism. So getting a lot of people that don't know the Lord, you, you think about who you want to invite, you pray about inviting them, and then you, you bring them to one of these crusades, okay. and uh, the gospel is preached. And so we'll usually bring in some, you know, cutting edge, you know, you know, top Christian artists, you know, it's right. very entertaining for folks. And, you know, Greg will, you know, do an interview with somebody, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he had... Uh, one of the Duck Dynasty guys on okay. uh, the program one of the times, or, you know, he's had Louis Zamberini, or that movie Unbroken's being made about yeah, yeah, yeah. World War II. Yeah, so uh, he'll have different guys in interviews, and then he uh, shares a gospel presentation that uh, just really makes sense. He does a very good job of communicating the gospel to, you know, the audience, the generations out there. It just really speaks their language. Okay. The gospel always stays the, sa the same, right. you know, but the, the approach to it, he just does it in a, in a very winsome way, yeah. and he gives all people that opportunity then. To, to turn from their sin and declare the faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And so we see people doing that, you know, by the thousands uh, each year. So I'm on the team that, that helps put these crusades together. I'm a crusade representative okay. uh, with Harvest. So it's pretty exciting stuff. You know, you talk a lot about repentance and turning from your sin, and, and, and we know that's a biblical concept. But sometimes people, like you said, are, are addicted to alcohol or addicted to whatever. How, you know, and repentance for you was just like, that whole Navy SEAL thing, like, boom, I'm, I'm done with that. You know what I mean? But for most people, I think it's a process. Agreed or not agreed? I would say that it's something that happens in a moment. It's a change of mind. It's a change of attitude. It's a whole change of being uh, an attitude towards sin. And it's God that ultimately helps you to make good on it. Okay. And so, you know, you know there's nothing that you can do to get really away from alcohol on your own. But if you, from a sincere heart, acknowledge that it's wrong mm -hmm. and that you don't want anything to do with it, but God help me because I keep going back to it, it's God that's ultimately going to give you the strength. Okay. It's, it's him that's ultimately going to give. He says there's no temptation uh, that has overtaken you that is, that is not common to man, but God is faithful. And with every temptation, he provides the way out. So whenever we do go slipping back, hopefully not swimming back to sin, but right. whenever we do go slipping back to it, uh, you could probably go roll back the tape and see where, uh, you know, you succumbed to a temptation where really you had a way out. Really you knew you, you should have, you could have, you know, began to pray. Right. And it's those little battles that you do win when you do do the right thing. So I, I'm, I'm falling into this, but then, you know, you, you have that conviction and you respond to that conviction not to do it. And you throw yourselves upon, you know, the mercy of God. Please right. help me 
and he does. He pulls you from it. He clears your mind. He clears your, you know, your heart, your mind. You, you think clearly. You're like, I didn't do it. You know, that's a little battle that you win. You begin to get stronger and stronger, and that's what it is, conforming to the image of Christ. So while we're here on earth, you know, justification, being forgiven of all of our sin, being forgiven of, you know, alcoholism and everything, that happens in an instant, in a moment. Sanctification is the thing that's the process. That's where we're trying to live up to who we are already, positionally speaking. Right. And that's where, you know, Paul says, look, he says, not that I've already attained or I'm already perfected, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and pressing forward to those things which are ahead, towards the upper call, which is in Christ Jesus. And so that's what life on earth is. It's, it's maturity in Christ. It's not years in Christ. It's conformity to Christ. So right. you could have somebody that's a one-year-old Christian who is more conformed to Christ than somebody that's been at it for, for 20 years. Right. And so that's what really the focus needs to be, is, is conforming to Christ. You're forgiven of your sin once you really have repented mm -hmm. of it. You don't need to go back dwelling on it and stewing over it. Mm -hmm. He says it's, it's like water under the bridge. Forgetting those things which are behind, just press forward to those things which are ahead. And so that, that part is a process. Okay. That's, that's what it is to begin to mature in Christ. Great. Thank you so much for coming. We just loved having you. Um, for those of you that are watching us online, uh, if you want to know how to come to Jesus, he explains it all in session number one. And we always say it's very simple. You just say, I give. I mean, basically, it's, I'm, I'm trusting you to take away my sin, and now I'm giving my life to you. So it's pretty simple. It's just, uh, just working that out is a little bit more difficult, I think. So thanks for coming and hanging out with us. Would you like to pray for everyone before we go? Sure would. Uh, Lord, we just thank you so much uh, for this, uh, this morning, this afternoon that we have. And Lord, we just pray that uh, this time would be uh, glorifying to you, that you would be pleased with it, Lord. I pray for everyone here and everyone listening right now, uh, Lord, that uh, you would just really begin to uh, embolden them uh, to go out and uh, declare your gospel, Lord, that they would show people uh, the love of Christ, that they would communicate the love of Christ to others, Lord, that we would really rise to the occasion, that we would be good sled dogs for you and give you a good run while we're here on earth, uh, that we would be good managers of the resources that you have given us. We realize that really all is yours. We don't have anything, but you have given us so much to manage on your behalf. And so I just pray that we would all be faithful with those things. We're thankful to be just a, a part of this. And uh, we love you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Just to say, God, I'm adding you into my equation. I'm adding you into this problem. And when I, God had a purpose for his pit, just like he has a purpose for your pit that you're into, he's not going to let you down. When you believe the Bible and the Bible alone, I said, that's what we do. Suddenly, one day, you're going to wake up and you're going to be like, I don't really have animosity towards that person anymore. But I promise you that I think today you'll be really, really encouraged at the very end because I learned something I never even thought of.